Hi, biology students. This is a video that I prepared for Biology 212, Fundamentals of Microbiology. Now, most of you know me, but if you're watching this video and you're not one of my students, let me introduce myself. My name is Wendy Gideon, and I am a tenured professor at Palomar College in San Diego. I have a master's degree in medical microbiology from the University of California at Davis, and I have a lifelong interest in infectious disease. Now I've prepared this video for my microbiology students, and it is part of their required curriculum. However, this is a video that's intended for undergraduate students in biology or people with a general interest in the coronavirus pandemic. This is a historical moment. This is a pandemic of proportions that we have never seen in our lifetime. To have the entire world shut down to the degree that has occurred in the last few months has, has been an event that has actually never occurred in history. So you are likely very curious about the scenario, perhaps even scared or worried for your safety and the health of those you love. There has never been perhaps a time in history where an understanding of biology is more important than now. This video was recorded on May 6th, 2020, and reflects a comprehensive scientific literature review of the scientific literature to date of about 20 different scientific research articles, many of which that I referenced in this lecture. But if you are interested in my complete list of around 20 scientific journal articles that I used to research before I presented this lecture, um, I can provide those to you upon request. So, Most of my students know that I have a fascination with infectious disease that have, has led me to collect these giant microbe um, organisms that I usually use in my classes on microbiology. So here you can see on the left of the screen an electron microscopy picture of coronavirus. And on the right, you can see the giant microbe version, which is a plush form of this virus. Please note that the virus does not have eyes. That has just been added for, I guess, cuteness. However, you do notice the, the spike proteins in yellow. Of course, the name corona in Latin means crown, and that's where the coronavirus gets its name. It's based off of its morphology. Under the microscope, it has this crown of viral spikes. So my plan in this lecture, I'm going to give you a history and an overview of the evolution and the lineage of viruses in the family coronaviridae, as well as their associated diseases in humans. We'll talk about the structure and the life cycle of the coronavirus of interest today, which is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is the cause of COVID-19. So we'll talk about COVID-19 pathology, diagnosis of COVID-19, including the current test testing options, and treatment options for COVID-19 as well as risk factors. 
So first let's talk about the family Corona Viridae. So there are at least no, seven known coronaviruses that circulate in human populations, most of which have mild or cold-like symptoms. There are three pathogenic forms, those that have made recent history and caused disease, significant disease in humans. They are all part of a subcategory we call beta coronavirus. The first I'd like to talk about is SARS-CoV. A lot of times this is also referred to as SARS-CoV-1. That's because this is the original SARS virus, the cause of the disease we call SARS. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. SARS originated in 2002 in China. Epidemics shortly spread to China and Hong Kong and there were isolated cases elsewhere in the world. The majority of the people who contracted SARS in 2002 and 2003 had a severe reaction. It did cause a respiratory distress syndrome similar to what we are seeing in today's COVID patients. However, these patients also had severe diarrhea and vomiting. The r naught is estimated at about 0.7 to, to 3. Now, if you're not a student of infectious disease or a microbiology student, you may not know what that value represents. So the r naught in general is a value we use in infectious disease to approximate how many people a sick person would infect. So if one person is sick, that one person will infect between 0.7 and 3 healthy people with SARS. The lineage of SARS originated in bats. How do we know that? Well, we're able to do genetic analysis on the genome of these viruses that can allow us to compare genetic sequences with known coronaviruses that infect bats. So the SARS virus is very closely related to a bat coronavirus. And we also think there was an intermediate host before that bat coronavirus transferred into humans. And the likely intermediate host is a civet. This is a picture of a civet here on the slide. Some people think it looks like a cat, but it's actually more closely related to a mongoose. So this virus passed from bats to civets to humans. And these events are, are rare. They occur as a result of mut mutations in the virus, in the structure of the virus that allows it to change its host range. So Usually viruses are very well adapted to a specific species they infect as well as a particular cell type they infect. But sometimes, and in particular RNA viruses, and these are all a group of viruses that have an RNA genome, are highly mutagenic and slight changes in their genetic code can affect the proteins that they produce on their surface and can can affect what types of cells they can infect. These types of events that occur where a, a disease that originates in wildlife transmits into the human population is called a zoonotic spillover. So in July of 2003, SARS basically went extinct. At that time, the case fatality rate was documented at around 10%. How do we come up with that number? What we do is we take the number of deaths and we divide that by the total cases. So for SARS, total cases were 770, or sorry, 
Number of deaths were 774 and total cases were 8,086. So that gives us 9.6%. And by the way, yes, you need to multiply by 100 to get that into a percent, okay, or approximately a 10% fatality rate. Okay, about 10 years later, MERS evolves. So MERS-CoV is the name of the virus and it's the cause of MERS. MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And a range of severity here from people that have no symptoms, which we call asymptomatic, to people with severe or fatal reactions to this virus. The reason why it's called Middle East respiratory syndrome is that it, it seemed to have originated in Saudi Arabia, and that's primarily where the epidemics have been, as well as an epidemic in South Korea. The r naught is fairly low. The transmission was from bats, another zoonotic spillover, from bats, this time into camels, and then into humans. In particular, it seemed to have been from drinking the milk from camels. This has a very high case fatality rate of 34%. Okay, so that brings us to today. Today, the world faces SARS-CoV-2. This is the name of the coronavirus that cause, causes COVID-19, which stands for coronavirus disease. The 19 means that it originated in 2019, approximately late of November 2019 or early December. We have been in the midst of this pandemic now for about two months. The range of the severity, well, there's quite a range, ranging from people that have no symptoms to mild symptoms to severe and fatal complications of the infection. This originated in Wuhan, China, and then spread worldwide. And we use that word pandemic when we have cases that have spread worldwide to high levels. The R naught is between two to three. So that's again an approximation, but that means one sick person on average will transmit to two to three people. That gives you an idea of how quickly this virus can spread through populations and why it spread so quickly. We have world travel, people on airplanes, people traveling to different parts of the world, bringing with them their germs and coughing and spreading that disease exponentially is what that R not value is telling us. So the origin story of SARS-CoV-2 is still a bit of a mystery. We don't entirely know. A lot of the problem is that we know it originated in Wuhan. However, access to Wuhan is very limited right now. So scientists aren't able to get in and investigate in the way that needs to happen in order to really figure out and do the tracing needed to um, understand the origin story. We do know that the um, COVID-19 began in Wuhan. There were a cluster of around 27 cases in December of 2019. And these were people that had visited um, a seafood market so this virus is also very closely related to bats. The proposed intermediate host is pangolin, and that's again from doing a genetic analysis on the RNA genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in comparison to virus, the coronaviruses that infect pangolins, as well as the coronaviruses that infect bats. I put a question mark there because it's still unclear um, if, this was caused by people handling pangolins. Um, if it 
even had anything to do with that seafood, seafood market in Wuhan at all. If this was a virus that was being experimented on in a lab in Wuhan and escaped the lab, there are various other conspiracy theories along those lines. But the truth is nobody knows right now. As of now, we don't know, and maybe we never will know. Case fatality rate. I also put a question mark there. I could show you the numbers. You're not gonna like it, but I can show you the numbers that we have because these cases are being tallied up and are publicly available to, to see. So if I show you the numbers, the numbers are again as, uh, as of, May, May 6, 2020 at approximately one o'clock in the afternoon, Pacific Standard Time, <laughs> okay? So I can tell you that right now, worldwide deaths are 260,938. Okay, that's our deaths. And total infected, is 3,724,688. We take that value and we multiply it by 100. You know, you get, you get approximately 7%. However, I don't think that that is accurate. The reason is that there's still more testing that needs to be done. There's been um, ineffic inefficient testing, really that denominator is probably way higher due to problems with testing as well as a lot of these asymptomatic carriers of COVID not being tested. So if people are not being tested, they won't be in the denominator of this equation. So most experts approximate that in reality, we're probably going to see a case fatality rate of around one to 3% once everything is said and done. But again, that's highly variable and uncertain at this time. Let's talk about transmission. So respiratory droplets seems to be the most common way that this virus is transmitted. What that means is that in general, people with COVID-19 have a cough. And if they're coughing, they're gonna be spewing out these respiratory droplets that will have viral particles in those droplets. And then if you're in close proximity, direct contact with somebody who's coughing, then you will inhale those respiratory droplets and become uh, exposed to the virus. So it is also proposed that it transmits by aerosols. The difference between respiratory droplets and aerosols is that in aerosols, we're talking about virus that is in the air. So somebody coughs and rather than that drop, you know, the droplets usually um, propel out and then they fall to a surface or they land on somebody who's in close proximity. If you're maybe talking to somebody and you're really close together. Now, again, this is where the social distancing has come in. This, you know, six feet apart from somebody, the wearing of the masks, you know, all of that, it has to do with, we know it's in direct contact with people who are sick, who are coughing, who have respiratory droplets coming out, maybe even just talking. So there is evidence that the aerosolized form of the virus is infectious, meaning that you're coughing and then somebody leaves the room or they cough into a, a subway and then that person exits the subway. Does that cough, those particles that are invisible, okay, they're called aerosols, do they just stay in the air? And there's some evidence to suggest that they do. Not for long periods of time, but somewhere between 30 minutes to three hours. So more data needs to be done to really nail that one down. Um, third method of transmission is fomites. Now this is a word we use in infectious disease. 
And it's a word that means surfaces. So door handles, um, tables, clothing, um, cardboard boxes, those sorts of things. So we're talking about a an indirect method of transmission from person to person. So somebody coughs, and this is why one of the other recommendations to avoid contracting the disease besides social distancing is to avoid touching your face because on average we we touch our face a couple times you know um you know every few minutes so um we're constantly touching our face and and if we've touched an object that was handled by somebody who did cough okay or who did have respiratory secretions on their hands and then we touch that same object later and then we touch our mouth okay now you have inoculated yourself with the coronavirus okay so the virus is going to get in through your nose or your mouth and we're constantly touching our nose and our mouth and so fomite transmission may be a big layer in how this is spreading which is why lots of places have shut down from playgrounds, obviously schools, um, many and most businesses, gyms, just because we know that this virus is surviving on surfaces um, and the type of, there's research on what type of surfaces are more likely to harbor the virus, but we're looking at anywhere from a few hours that virus is viable on a surface to in some cases up to five days depending on the surface. So this is why we want to be washing our hands as another way to avoid the spread. So washing your hands is an effective way to remove the coronavirus. The recommended amount of time to wash your hands is about the length of time it takes you to sing happy birthday to yourself. Make sure you're using warm water rather than cold. Make sure you're using soap and make sure you're vigorously scrubbing your hands together. And those soap molecules, they do lodge themselves into the membrane of this virus and they facilitate ripping apart the virus and it is successful. Also disinfecting surfaces. We notice this when you go to the grocery store it is, it is quite an ordeal to go to the grocery store now, it is, isn't it? Not only do you wear a mask and some people even wear gloves, but a lot of times they restrict the amount of people that can be in a store at a time where you're waiting in a line outside, maybe six feet apart from, from other people. Um, you're trying to avoid touching your face the whole time. Everybody's avoiding eye contact. Um, and then when you get your shopping cart, um, what I've noticed is that they have the employees out there wiping down all of the shopping carts with disinfectant. So you get a disinfected, hopefully, shopping cart. And that's, again, these disinfectants, especially bleach solutions, are definitely effective at removing the virus. So I mentioned a fourth possible transmission route on the slide, fecal to oral. This we know definitely played a role in the first round of SARS in 2002. But those individuals definitely had vomiting and diarrhea associated with their illness. And very few people with COVID-19, somewhere around just 5% of people with COVID-19 actually have um, diarrhea. So it, what would need to happen is the virus would need to be passed through feces and then what happens is, again, if people are not properly washing their hands after they use the restroom, they can get some of those fecal particles on their hands that contain the active virus. And then they might transmit it by either handling an object that somebody else touches later or preparing food that somebody else touches and then ingest the particle, the viral particles. So, there is some evidence that this may be a possibility, but to a, a lesser degree than in the first SARS outbreak. So 
with regards to these two different or three different versions of coronavirus, what do we know in terms of, the, of what we call phylogeny? Now, if you've been studying with me in general biology, you know about this term phylogeny. This refers to the evolutionary relationships among organisms. Now, viruses are strange because they're actually not living organisms, but they do have a genetic code. So therefore we can do genetic analysis of viruses and we could do something called a sequence comparison to line up the RNA sequence of all these different samples of coronavirus. And we can look where we see sequence similarities. And many researchers have published this data. And you can see two examples here on the slide. So what they've created here is what's called a phylogenetic tree of relationship. And what do we know from this? Well, we know that bat coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 are very closely related. You do the sequence comparison and bat coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 are 96.3% similar. So that's very, very convincing evidence that this virus originated in bats. It's also less, less of a degree, but also related to pangolin COVID virus, which remember is the um, suspected intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2. How closely related is SARS-CoV-2, um, there's SARS-CoV-2, okay, with, so remember, it's very closely related to the bat, bat um, virus, COVID virus, to the original SARS-CoV-1, the 2002 strain, how closely related is it? If we do the sequence comparison, it's 79% similar to SARS-CoV-1. Uh, how similar is it to MERS? It's 50% similar to MERS. So this is why we, we put the two SARS viruses in the same lineage um, because, or similar lineage, because they're, they are clo more closely related than they are to the MERS coronavirus. So now I wanna talk to you about this virus and how it invades cells. So pictured here, we see an image taken from this scientific paper. And this is an image that was captured using a very specialized microscope called an electron microscope. Electron microscopes are very expensive and very powerful. They allow us to view um, viruses. Well, how big is a virus? Well, viruses are extremely small. They are about a thousand times smaller than bacteria. And if you've taken a course in microbiology, you've seen bacteria under the microscope in our laboratory class and they are very small. They look almost like little specks of dust at our highest magnification, which is a thousand X that we have in our classroom microscopes. So the electron microscopes allows us to enhance the image that we're seeing by a hundred thousand times its actual size. So that's the magnification that we get in general for the electron microscope. So here we can see an approximation of what the size range is. We measure, we measure viruses using the, the unit nanometer, okay, which is 10 to the minus ninth of a meter. Okay, so very one, one billionth of a meter or about a thousand times smaller than a micrometer which is how we measure bacteria. 
So what we're seeing is we're seeing inside of a kidney cell in this figure taken from this article. And they're showing us a vesicle. So this is a vesicle here. It's a membrane bound vesicle that's inside of a kidney cell. And inside here, we see a whole bunch of these little SARS viruses that have all these little spikes, the crown, right? So they have these all these little spikes, these little crown spikes. There's, there's a bunch in here. So if we use the scale to approximate the size of the coronavirus, well, it's showing us that this virus is probably about 60 nanometers in size, very small. So now let's represent that here. This is showing more of a cartoon image of the virus. So if you've been following along with my Virology 1 lectures for microbiology, you will have already uh, studied the structure of viruses. If you've never studied the structure of virus, let me just briefly explain. So viruses are not cells, okay, but they have structures that are similar to cells. So all viruses have a genetic core, and that genetic core is nucleic acid, and that nucleic acid is either DNA or RNA, but neither, but, but uh, never both, okay? So it's some form of DNA and some form of RNA. It could be double-stranded or it could be single-stranded. So it turns out that SARS-CoV-2, which is pictured here and is the star of the remaining of this lecture, okay? So SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. That means it has an RNA genome, and that's pictured here. Now, the form of it is actually positive sense single-stranded RNA. And if you went through the lecture videos for virology part one, microbiology students, you will know what that means, okay? So all viruses have some sort of genome. SARS-CoV-2 has a positive sense single-stranded RNA genome. Then that genome is protected, and it's protected in a protein coating, and that protein coating is called a capsid. So all viruses are at minimum a genetic core plus a protein capsid. And we can see that word capsid here. So there's a capsid that's protecting it, okay, and it, it's, it's calling that the nucleocapsid, which is usually the term we use to refer to both the RNA plus the capsid that protects that RNA. This is a virus that's also enveloped. So envelopes are acquired by certain viruses that bud from their host cells, and they essentially steal the lipid coating of the cell as they escape their cells during the release stage of their life cycle. So this virus is enveloped. It also has various other proteins that we see here, including um, membrane protein M, hemagglutinin esterase, or HE, and glycoprotein spike S, called the S protein or the S spike. So SARS-CoV-2 primarily infects cells that are in the respiratory system. And these are cells that express a particular receptor that we call the ACE2 receptor. So the type of cell that I've drawn in this diagram, this is the cell that is most worrisome if this cell becomes invaded by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this cell is a type 2 pneumocyte. So it's well known that there are cells with this receptor in the nose in the mouth, on the tongue, and in the lungs, as well as other parts of the body, actually. The kidneys, the liver, your heart, 
the brain. So it's a fairly common receptor. I'm not going to go into the details about what it's normally used for because that's fairly complex. So in the initial reports of COVID-19, the type 2 pneumocyte uh, that was targeted in the infection was particularly troublesome because this is a respiratory cell that lines your lungs. And your lungs are very important because that is how you get the oxygen that you need for cellular respiration. So what happens? Well, let's draw the little virus here. So the viral S protein binds to the ACE2 receptor. The virus is engulfed in an endosome, uncoats, and the ribosomes translate the proteins of the virus. Recall, one of those is RNA replicase. This is the enzyme that replicates the RNA genome, producing many copies. These get assembled into new viruses, and these new viruses bud from the cell. Many new viruses are born. So let's go ahead and just label the anatomy of the lungs. And let's zoom in on an alveolus. The yellow cells are the type 2 pneumocytes that coronavirus invades. And these are the cells that produce the surfactant, the yellow highlighted area. This is also the location of gas exchange. Remember, the alveolar macrophages are in the alveoli. They become stimulated by the infection and release cytokines. These cytokines cause vasodilation of the pulmonary capillaries and fluid builds up in the alveolar space called alveolar edema. Gas exchange decreases, surface tension in increases, and the alveolar collapse. This also triggers an influx of neutrophils. Neutrophils and natural killer cells are highly destructive white blood cells. They destroy cells and a buildup of cell protein and debris called consolidation also contributes to the decrease in gas exchange. All of this is associated with the symptoms of COVID, shortness of breath, cough, and a fever greater than 100.4. Ultimately, patients die from acute respiratory distress syndrome and their blood pressure plummets. On chest x-ray, we could see the visual display of this occurring. This is called ground glass opacity. Notice that you can also see the ground glass opacity on a CT scan. This type of scan is taken while a patient lays down. And you can also see that their gas exchange would be dramatically reduced as a result of the infection. This paper also so shows us histology reports. This is shown from a patient who died from COVID. And on post-mortem examination, we can see the infiltration of those white blood cells, the neutrophils, shown here in purple. Let's circle them. So lots of these purple cells. These would all be neutrophils. Remember, this is the destructive white blood cell that in this case contributes largely to destruction of healthy tissue in the lungs as the immune system desperately tries to control this infection. Now I'd like to talk about diagnosing COVID-19. So generally there's two different approaches. One approach is to take a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. The purpose of this test is to collect mucus in the mouth or in the nose that contains the viral particles of SARS-CoV-2. Those samples will then be sent to a lab where the lab will perform a genetic analysis called RT-PCR. The purpose of this test is to detect specific genes that are unique to SARS-CoV-2. Those include genes like the S gene, the N gene, as well as another gene called ORF1AB. The problem with this test is that you do need specialized personnel who are trained to perform this laboratory test and a certified lab. 
So it takes a few days and on its own, this test is around 30 to 80% sensitive. However, it is effective at ruling out infection with other types of viruses that can cause very similar symptoms as COVID, such as influenza A and influenza B. The second type of test is a type of test we call serology. This is the rapid IgG IgM test. Here we take a drop of blood from the patient and it may contain antibodies produced by the immune system that are specific against SARS-CoV-2. So recall that antibodies are specific to viral antigens and they prevent the virus from attaching to host cells. You'd put a drop of blood on the test strip and it would move by capillary action. You'd wanna make sure you've got a positive control line to make sure the test is valid. The test will detect two different types of antibody. Recall IgM is a very large pentamer and made first in an in infection. So this would detect a current or active infection where IgG, which is smaller, would detect a past or recovered infection. In combination with RT-PCR, serology is a 99% sensitive test. In addition, it's a rapid test, so you can get your results within minutes rather than days. So now I'd like to walk you through some treatments that are currently being tested as antivirals to prevent viral replication. So let's go back to our diagram that we did of the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. So the medications that act as antivirals are going to target a specific stage of the viral life cycle. The first antiviral I'd like to discuss is chloroquine. So chloroquine is an anti-malarial drug. And the way it works, well, it's suspected to have several different effects, but it does block viral endosome formation. So chloroquine would block this stage in the viral life cycle. Remdesivir, which we talked about last week in the lecture videos, acts as a nucleotide analog. Remember, that means it's sort of like a decoy nucleotide. It looks like adenosine and unknowingly RNA replicase incorporates it into single-stranded RNA. However, once it gets incorporated, it blocks further replication of that RNA and will prevent replication of the viral nucleic acid. Favipiravir is a RNA replicase inhibitor that has basically the same effect as remdesivir. The only difference is that it directly binds to RNA replicase and blocks that enzyme. The effect would again be no viral RNA. And if there's no viral RNA, then the virus wouldn't be able to package itself into new viral particles and exit the cell. So let's go back to this diagram in our notes. Recall, the damaging effects of acute respiratory distress syndrome are a result of release of many different cytokines by the white blood cells that are there to protect us from the virus, but unknowingly, they are doing more harm than good. By the way, this type of effect where you get lots and lots of signaling of cytokines, which is what we see in many of the patients who have severe infections, this type of reaction is referred to as a cytokine storm. In other words, too many cytokine signals or inflammatory signals are produced by white blood cells and it acts like a storm in the body. It overwhelms the body and in this case is responsible for the fluid buildup, the buildup of dead cells, proteins and pus that's accumulating in the alveoli. And this is what's causing the damaging effects that 
can be fatal. So some of the treatments involve blocking the immune response itself. Now, Tylenol as a fever reducer is something that we can take over the counter without a prescription. That will reduce the fever that's triggered um, as a result of interleukin-1. Remember, that's going to be producing a fever response. So Tylenol would be blocking that fever response. Um, toxilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor. So IL-6 was down here. So remember, that is one of the cytokines that contributes to the inflammation. So blocking that would be an effective treatment. As well as corticosteroids. These are general anti-inflammatory um, medications that are used to control an overreactive inflammatory response. Additional therapies are looked at as well, including treatments that could boost a helpful immune response. So the immune system is definitely there to protect us. It's damaging us in some ways, but can we boost the helpful responses? In particular, some innate antiviral responses. So recall that these yellow cells are the type two pneumocytes that become infected with COVID. So let's say the virus enters the airways that virus is gonna come and attack the cell. But remember, sometimes these cells can secrete interferons, like interferon alpha and interferon beta. These act as signals that can go and warn uninfected cells and also tell infected cells to block replication of the virus. So using intravenous injections of interferon is being studied as a potential therapy. Another idea is to treat patients with convalescent donor antibody. So this would be from people who recovered from COVID. If you recovered from COVID, you likely have circulating antibody, these Y-shaped proteins that bind to viruses and prevent viral infection. So the idea would be that these would be transmitted to patients who have an active COVID infection. These antibodies would diffuse into the alveoli or wherever the virus is located, maybe in the nasal mucosa and would bind to it. And when the virus is bound with antibody like that, remember that's a coating around it that prevents attachment. So it won't be able to attach to its ACE2 receptor. Another idea is to transfuse with convalescent donor CD8 positive T cells. Now, an interesting finding in the pathology reports of people infected with COVID is that they actually have a decreased lymphocyte count. We call this lymphopenia. So patients with COVID are showing a decreased lymphocyte count. This might be an explanation for the excessive damage in the lungs caused by the nonspecific immune response. Remember, CD8 positive T cells, also known as cytotoxic T cells, are highly specific. In other words, they would be able to recognize a virally infected cell specifically and just kill that cell without causing mass destruction in the alveoli. So let's say we have a cytotoxic T cell here. And that cytotoxic T cell would come and recognize, say we have a, a virally infected cell here. Okay, say that one's virally infected. So why we like cytotoxic T cells rather than natural killer cells and neutrophils. So neutrophils and natural killer cells, they destroy everything in their path. They're non-specific immunity, remember? Specific immune cells like cytotoxic T cells, they are specifically programmed to only recognize cells 
that are infected with the specific viral antigen. So this cell that's infected here, this infected cell is essentially wearing a badge on its surface that's advertising to the immune system, hey, I'm infected. And remember, an infected cell, that's not a good cell because it is replicating more virus. So you want that cell to die. And that cell is essentially advertising for that. So you want the cytotoxic T cell to come in, bind to this infected cell, and destroy this infected cell before new viruses can be born and released. Now, although that will cause some damage in the alveoli, it won't be as destructive as what we are seeing with the neutrophil and the natural killer cell mediated non-specific destructive response in the alveoli. So that's why it's also being looked at as a potential treatment. Now, all of these are currently going through clinical trials and studies and careful testing to see if this will be effective. And it might just be some combination of these drugs is going to be an effective treatment. So lastly, I want to mention, what about a vaccine? Well, there are at least a hundred different vaccine candidates that are in clinical trials or in the early stages of development. Vaccines take time. Some of these vaccines are looking at the RNA as a vaccine candidate or the spike protein that we talked about, or perhaps um, uh, other features of the virus. So the earliest we would see that would be 2021. And that's because vaccines have to be very carefully tested with multiple stages in the clinical trials. The reason is that vaccines are given to healthy people. It's not a treatment. It's given to people before they become infected. And when we put something into a healthy person, you need to make sure that this is something that is not going to cause a harmful immune response or have any adverse reactions. So although the government has told us 12 to 18 months for a vaccine, I personally am highly skeptical of that as the earliest uh, vaccine uh, trials that I've ever heard of were about five years. So could it be fast-tracked? Maybe, uh, but I wouldn't hold my breath. So the last thing I want to leave you with is just a brief discussion of the risk factors for developing COVID-19, as well as what does the scientific research tell us in terms of what should we expect if we do become infected? Now, keep in mind, this is all experimental data and further testing and further documentation of all of the cases that are being documented worldwide will help give us a complete picture of this story. What we do have comes primarily out of uh, other countries that have been ahead of us in the infection process, including China and parts of Europe. And some of that data, prelim preliminary data, tells us that 81% of people who contract COVID-19 actually have mild symptoms, and 18% are asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms at all. Mild symptoms might mean a runny nose, maybe a sore throat, but it stops at that. Also, of all the deaths that have been reported so far, 80% of those deaths have been in people who are greater than 65 years old or they had underlying health conditions to begin with. So are there young, healthy people coming down with COVID and dying from COVID? Are there children dying from COVID? Yes, there are. And oftentimes those are the cases presented in the news, the young 30-year-old man fighting for his life in the ICU, the two-year-old who dies from COVID. So certainly those are cases that do occur and really every death has um, a story behind it and 
is incredibly sad. Uh, every death that has been documented, that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's father, that's somebody's grandmother, that's somebody's child. Um, but I do think it's important for you to assess your own risk and uh, consider that it is age related. So risk factors do indicate uh, those that are over 65 years old. Now, the reason behind that is debatable. It might be because as we age, it becomes more difficult to repair damage that is done from an infection. And we've looked at the significant damage in this lecture that can occur to the alveoli in the lungs. So we learned in mitosis that cells do replace themselves and do heal and do repair. And that is a possibility, but it's more likely to see that in younger people than in older populations. So underlying health conditions, 60% um, of all COVID patients have hypertension or cardiovascular disease. Uh, also diabetes is highly linked to people who are uh, developing the severe forms of the infection. And obesity is oftentimes linked to diabetes, as well as these uh, conditions, people are taking medications for these conditions. And there's some preliminary data that suggests that some of the medications, especially for hypertension, may actually be increasing the expression of ACE2 on cells. And remember, ACE2 is the way that the virus gets into your cells to establish an infection. So it's like the doorway that the virus walks through. And some medications will increase the number of these doorways, which would increase the likelihood of your uh, infection. Of course, healthcare workers, first responders are at high risk. Uh, this can be minimized with correct PPE, which is personal protective equipment. So wearing a mask, wearing gloves, wearing a face shield, um, being cautious, and I know these people are doing the best they can. There have been shortages of some of this PPE, and this is really gonna minimize their exposure to the respiratory droplets, which is the primary method of transmission. Some other interesting uh, information that I found in my research which may be completely insignificant, um, but just a slightly higher number of men than women contracting COVID. Um, who knows what the explanation is for that? Some research indicates, um, or some hypotheses are that perhaps there are hormones that are produced in the female body that may be um, uh, suppressing the viral uh, uh, progression and replication but really that needs to be further researched. If there's any validity to that, um, we will see. Also, a lot of questions uh, people have, and even myself have, why do some people get such severe infection and others do not, or in the mild category or the asymptomatic category? We really don't have the answer to that right now, um, but we do know that there are genetic polymorphisms that exist in every population. And in cases of pandemics, especially pandemics of the past, these genetic polymorphisms have become uh, a, a key way to understand the disease uh, variations that we see. So in other words, genetically, some people might produce more of this ACE2 receptor or they may overproduce this damaging cytokine we learned about today, interleukin-6, and all of that would impact the way that this disease is uh, presented in your body and the degree to which you get sick. Anyways, I hope all of this was informative and educational for you. I hope you also understand that this is a rapidly evolving situation with new information that is constantly being updated. And so in the future, of course, I will have to update this video um, to give you more current information. This is up to date as of May 7th, 2020. So 
take care of yourself, take care of each other, and don't forget to wash your hands. That's all for me today, guys, and we'll talk to you next time.